So I was talking with a pastor. This is a new client to Church Answers, and um, he's needing help uh, basically closing his church. And they've kind of had a long road. It's his, you know, he's uh, he he was uh, not not full time in ministry. He, he does other things professionally, and he's just been part of this church. He's helped him out, and he's like, "Hey, I, I think that time has come." Now, everyone knows where I stand on this. I don't like I don't like it when churches close. I don't think churches should close. I don't like it when churches die. But sometimes you're just at that point. There's no way out. What do you do? And that's what this episode is going to be about. So, Dad, we've got these five issues to consider when it comes to closing your church. And sadly, this is kind of this is becoming an uh, increasing number of requests with uh, with us, at least. Yeah, we've been doing studies um, on what I call the moribund churches, which are the churches that are close to the point of death. Um, and you know, the reality of it is I'm, I'm starting to use the number 375,000 for Protestant churches because I get 350 and I get 400. Even in Pew, I get different numbers. So I'm starting to use 375 as kind of my median on that. And out of 375,000 churches, if we are seeing what we think we're seeing, 100,000 churches over the next five years will be in that moribund state. Many of them will close, but many of them will be on the precipice of closing. As what well. does moribund mean? It means near death. Okay. Just to just to clarify, yeah, and I'm bet 100 percent of the listeners would like to know as well. When I hear moribund, I kind of hear man bun, but that has a different connotation. Yeah, so, it really, it really, it really does. But they're both deadly. So, if you're a really sick hipster, does that make you a moribund man bun? It does. It really okay. does. Yeah, that just came out of my well, mouth, and I don't know why it did. So. Anyway, we let Upward Sports come out of your mouth. <laughs> yeah, we need to move on. Hey, thank you, Upward Sports, for sponsoring today's episode. Uh, absolutely love working with Upward. They have an amazing team. They have great people, and their ministry is top notch. What do they do? Totally. They they can help bridge your church into the community, and the way they do that is through recreation ministry, sports ministry. Um, they're the world's largest Christian youth sports organization. They will come alongside of your church. They will help you advance the gospel. And I know you've got sports fanatics in your church, and even those that aren't sports fanatics can get involved. They've got a program that can work with any size church anywhere, whether you have a gym or not. And here's the deal. They are offering a 2024 sports startup grant of $500. So how do you get this grant? Upward.org slash church answers. Link in the show notes. But again, upward.org slash church answers. They'll you schedule a call, they'll walk you through it. Uh, this is a great mission partner. I love what they do. They do this kind of outreach better than anyone else. And now, because they are so generous, they're offering this five hundred dollar sports grant. You can claim that grant at upward.org slash church answers. I just want to So echo not a subject term. I really want to talk about, Dad, but it's one that's necessary because this is so I, I, many churches now. Well, I, first of all, I just I wanted to echo and affirm what you're saying about Upward. I love working with them. You know, we, we often say we're proud to have them as a sponsor. We are proud to have them as a sponsor. We we say no to sponsors because we we have to make sure we're aligned. But Upward Sports is one that we're aligned in. There's something else I forgot to mention, Sam, in a previously recorded podcast before we get to this more dreadful thing about talking about closing churches. I had someone email me and wanted to know why I only had a photo of Jess on my desk and, 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 and no one else. Now, I just want y'all to know it doesn't all show. They're all there. They're all there. Oh, man. So, no, man. So, and, and I see that oh, picture. And so it's kind of tough to tell, but all the way down on the bottom left there, and this you can only see this if you're watching on YouTube, is uh, my mom with President George Bush. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two artists looking at a picture together. It is. There's a neat, neat story with that, but there, we don't there, have time. There it is. Yeah, we don't have we don't have time to tell it. Um, you, the way you panned, like if someone was really astute, they would have been like, "Wait a minute, G George W. Bush is not a rainer. What? What? Why is he in this picture?" Well, it, it's, there's a picture of my mom, with the president, and yeah. Anyway, really neat story. They're, they're talking about painting. they're talking about painting. They both paint. Yeah. So. There's yes. that's the All right. so that's I'm, the short of the I story. Just want, 
I just want the viewers to understand I do have more than one son and I may need to start alternating families in this part of the frame. Fair enough. All right, let's get let's get let's get back from family members to dead things. So I don't think that's a good segue, but we're going to go that way. Here's some questions to answer. Should we close our church? I love this first question. All right, I'm going to preface it with this. God put your church in your community to be a gospel presence. That then begs the question, what will be the gospel presence in your church, in your community, if the church closes? Sam? Yes. And so let's just use this particular individual who I've been working with as a case study. Um, in their case, they have like 12 or 15 people, and there's a church literally right down the road that they all love, that they're all willing to be a part of, and they're going to turn the facility into a – potentially turn the facility into a counseling center – a Christian counseling mm. center. So it's one of these things where actually the gospel presence will increase if two churches merge and we use the other facility for Christian counseling. And, you know, there's a donor involved and it's just like, wow, this is ready made. And this is, it's so, I don't even know why they called me. I'm just basically telling them, yeah, you sh everything yeah. you're thinking you should do. I mean, let's just go do that. Well, actually the reason they call me is because obviously there's some stickiness with getting everything done. Uh, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, th I think that's a very good question. What's the gospel presence in your community if the church closes? In this case, and I very rarely say this because most of the time when churches close, it's a big negative. But in this case, I'm like, actually, this will work out. You know, you're, you're too few people for too, too big a facility. And if you're going to put a Christian counseling center in here and everyone's just going to go down to the church right down the road, this is, this is a really positive thing. And I hate it that a church got to that point. But I love how the church is, rather than just giving up, they are asking that question. What can we do to make sure that the gospel continues, even if we shut our church down? And I think that's a, Sam, if you have a facility, I think that's a really good thing to think about. You and West B and Southside made a similar decision. Essentially, you closed Southside as it was, reopened it as a part of West B. The gospel presence continues. They're now a campus, a site of West B, and the other entity legally closed, but the ministry presence is still there. So you've closed and opened as well. Yeah, we, we have done that. Um, and we originally started with Southside as a fostering agreement where it was like, hey, we'll just help you and try to get you back to where you need to be. And then it became apparent that they weren't going to get there on their own and they really didn't need to become part of our church. And though it's a smaller venue and a smaller group, it is still doing well down there. And I'm very proud of the, the efforts that they make to, to reach the neighborhood right around them. Question number two, if you're not going to close, are your current members willing to make dramatic changes? That's usually what stops it. I've told the story before, but it's been a long time. Your brother asked me to go talk to a church some few miles from Church of Spring Hill. Sure. Oh, I know this. I know this story. This is so. The, it has been a while since you've told this. So, if we've got some new listeners, if you're tuning it, you should definitely listen. Now is the time to listen. You set me up for it to be bad. <laughs> it's so but, funny, but, though. So he 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 said, "My dad is going to come talk to y'all." And there's a handful of people. I think maybe nine, ten left in the church. Oh, Tom Rainer's coming. He's going to tell us how to keep our church open and we're going to thrive. Tom Rainer's coming. Tom Rainer's coming. Well, I was about five minutes into the conversation and they did not like a thing that I was saying. And one of them interrupted me, raise their hand, raise their hand and said, let me ask you a question. We make changes. Do we have to put those screens up in our church? And it was at that point that I knew if we're worried about projection screens, as opposed to gospel presence, that it ain't going to happen. It just ain't going to happen. Jess looked at me and I looked at him and uh, we, that was it. And you know what happened to the church? It, it closed. Died. It died. Yeah, And that's the yeah. sad part of the story is there was a group that was ready to get them to a better place, willing to invest time and money. And because people were just, just completely absorbed in their own selfishness, there's less of a gospel presence in that community now because they didn't want to make and, any dramatic, you know, dr much dramatic changes, much less any changes. Like, the, well, you know, 
you got to be willing to make dramatic changes, but a lot of churches aren't even willing to make any changes, and, and that's, that's their problem. Well, another little piece of the story I may or may not have told was uh, we went over there and we're waiting for the crowd to show up of about nine people. And I'm just walking along, looking at the pews, looking in the pew backs. And I kind of anticipated this, so I was ready for it. Someone said, we like singing from the hymnal. And I said, which one? Y'all have got six different hymnals in your pews. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know that. So they just had different people donate hymnals. I don't know how they were singing in their hymnals, I guess. The same well, song they, 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 there's only like nine of them, so they just go to their little spot, and I guess they just all happen to be in the spot that had the same, the same one. They didn't notice all the other pews. They didn't know that. Okay, question number three. This is obvious but important. What is the church currently doing to reach the community with the gospel? Maybe one of the reasons that you're not reaching the community is you're not attempting to reach the community. That's one of the most profound statements I'll ever make. And I know, Sam, that you are going to echo and affirm my statement. Yes. Uh, you have to make an effort in order to see results. You have to do the work of the gospel in order to see the fruit of the gospel. And a lot of church, hear me out, a lot of churches would turn around quickly if they simply started doing some form of outreach, some form of evangelism, some outward focus, something as simple as, are you inviting your friends? Uh, which, by the way, we created Good News Neighbors for, which is a, you know, a very, it's one of our toolkits, very simple way to get your church thinking outwardly with gifts, going like giving it's your neighbors gifts. It, it's incredible. Great resource. tool great tool for any size church to begin to think outwardly. So, you know, before you close the doors, maybe you should just, and by the way, I'll put a link in the show notes to the resource. Um, before you close your doors, maybe you should think like, let's try to do some outreach. And mm -hmm. maybe if we actually follow the great commission and the acts pointed imperative and are obedient to the word of God, maybe God will honor us. Maybe we don't have to die. I think uh, even if it's a last, di last ditch effort, I think it's a positive thing. Even if you have to close the doors and people go to other churches, at least they will be doing so with the idea that we need to do evangelism. So this need you, you got to try. You got to try before you close your doors. So in that same church, there was the question about the screens. The next one was a statement from a man. I was about to call him a gentleman, but I I would err lest I do. So there was a man. He said, "Well, I tell you one thing." People in our community know where our church is, and they can come if they want to. They know where we are. So, you know, that was kind of the second stamp of affirmation that we just are not going to have much promise moving on in this church. Yeah, I would laugh, but it, 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 I mean, for, for a lot of our listeners, they're probably like, they know that person. But it, it's really, it, it's pain as a pastor, it's pain because this is a true story. It's painful to hear this because that heart is so hard. You know, it, it is. It, that's a very hard heart. And it, it you know, it just, you just kind of got to shake your head. And, you know, some of us have pastored those people. I'll just say that. <laughs> some the pastors listening going, yeah, I know that person. <laughs> I really do know that person. I can give you a name. I'll send you a card and a letter right away. Question number four. What is the deferred maintenance of your facility? Sam, would you define deferred maintenance? Yeah, um, it's called West Bradenton Baptist. <laughs> that's deferred that's deferred maintenance. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, when I came here about eight years ago, the, the facility had not been touched in at least 30 years. A long time. Some, yeah, some, t some parts of the facility had not been touched since the 1960s. Um, whenever someone asks for where the bathroom is, now we're, we're well into a renovation. We've put millions in the facility. God is really blessed. Our people have been so good about it. I joke now because, uh, w well, we've, we've just come a long way. So the joke is actually okay now. Um, but when people visit, still visit, actually, they ask where the bathroom is. I said, well, what kind of bathroom do you want? 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, or today? Like, what's your, what's your preference? Because we have all of them. 
So <laughs> one of the one of the last things that we're doing is bathrooms. And it's just it's just we we like to pay cash for as much as we can. We have a big air conditioning project as well. So we're just chipping away at it as we go. And I, I'm really proud of my church for the amount of progress that we've made. That being said, deferred maintenance is exactly what it sounds like. It's something that needs to be done, but you postpone it because you don't think you have the funds to do it. And exactly. the the downside of that is it all, things only get more expensive and they only add up. So when you don't renovate bathrooms for decades, when you don't replace your roof for, you know, 10 years beyond its lifespan, when you don't do anything with your air conditioning units, when you defer that maintenance, it only gets exponentially more expensive. And so it's better to deal with this on the front end than to obviously wait, which by the way, uh, church growth services. Um, Mike Stottlemyre can really, really help with this. Um, uh, you know, he it, he's on the fundraise on the on the fundraising side. They're they're one of the best. Hey, since we're gonna bring up sponsors, we got Brown Church Development that can actually do the work, and then you got Church Growth Services that can find the funds for it. Yeah, and Church Growth Services has a free ebook, Deferred Maintenance. So we'll put a link in uh, the show notes as well. Um, it's really really good resource there. So it's free. You should you should. You should go get it. They've got that free download for for them. So yeah, church growth cool. services can help you know kind of assess and from a generosity perspective help you understand what to do. And then Brown Church Development Group, they they can actually do the project, the, the you know the the capital project. And uh, two two great sponsors that we have uh, at Church Answers. I I love talking about them just because they're they're great people. And I want I just before we get off those two, I want to talk about uh, Brown. One of the things they do now that's relatively new, I'll say long term uh, planning, long range planning or, or master plan is what they call it. Uh, sometimes I need to explain that because people have an idea of what a master plan is. And it's this long drawn out process because you're going to build. No, they do your master plan, whether you're building or not, to tell you about best use of your facility for both the present and the and the future. And it's something I think all churches can do. And they can do it virtually if you want them to now with Google Earth and other tools. So I know we're getting away into sponsors, but uh, we've got two of our sponsors right now that are the best at this number four. Yeah. I mean, that's why we mention them, because they, they can be part of the solution. So if you don't know Brown Church Development Group, look them up. If you don't know Church Growth Services, look them up. They're, they're really, really great people. We've got a link. Last question. Have you considered becoming a site of another church. You've told the story of uh, Southside uh, more than one time, but I'm going to let you just kind of give a quick overview because you said that it started as fostering and then it went into another site. Yeah. I mean, if I was going to start another site, the location of where they are is not where I would put it, uh, mainly because they're right down the road from us. They're in a totally different neighborhood, so it ends up working out, but they're close enough to where, you know, we're, we're you know, we're about three miles apart. Uh, which in our neighborhood and where we are in Florida, three miles is actually a pretty long distance because everything is very yeah. densely packed in. Um, so it, it it works out all right. Um, but it just started with us like hearing about this church that was struggling. We had some common connections with some members and them reaching out to me, the church reaching out to me and just saying, hey, we're struggling. We, we lost our pastor. That was a whole tragic story um, that I just don't want to put on a podcast. And, and uh, sure. you know, and they – they just said, please help. And I said, okay, well, let's send you preachers. Let's send you a worship team. So we just started sending a rotation of people down there, um, just being like, and then assessing the situation and, you know, me being very firm with them as to, you're not going to make it unless you actually do something and them agreeing. And then after, I want to say about a year uh, of us fostering them, it was getting to the point to where it's like, guys, are you, are you actually going to do anything or not? Because we can't just keep sending people down here. You know, it's the, the nature of fostering. It's short term. You know, you're supposed to work to get them back to a place of better health. And uh, and finally, I just said, you know, we think the best thing is to become part of your church. We'd like to become part of West Brain. We like what's happening. And we think that if we're a permanent part of your church as a site, that we can actually do more. So um, we've got a campus pastor down there preaching. Uh, I've got a whole ministry philosophy down there of reaching the neighborhood. And though the work is slow, it's making very good progress. Um, and that's the nature of a lot of this. It's it's so much slower than I would like. You know, I would love to see it go more quickly. But a lot of times in these revitalization works, particularly churches that are close to death, you know, just getting the body, you know, use that metaphor, that biblical metaphor, getting the body back into shape takes takes a while, just takes a long time. And they were a moribund church. 
Yeah, they were. They, we started the adoption process right as COVID was hitting. Um, so they would not have survived it on their own. And uh, I don't recommend anybody doing that. So if there's another pandemic, hopefully not. Uh, d- d- adoption, fostering, it's just hard. Maybe God calls you to do it. He called us to do it, but the timing wasn't great at all. Um, but hey, God worked and they are doing well now. They're not where they need to be, but they are doing well. It's a great story. Go back and review these five questions. Should we close our church? I'm not going to repeat them. They're in the show notes. So you can rewind us if you want to. Uh, you can listen again, but whatever you do, go back and look at those five. They're five important questions. Before we close, I, you talk about a resource that brings excitement to you from one of our sponsors, the NTV Economic Bible Collection. It's a new Spanish translation and is accurate to the original translation, but it translates into clear contemporary Spanish. So if you have a Spanish speaking service, a Spanish speaking church, this will be great for it. This is a great way to reach into communities, maybe where they're first generation Spanish speaking people. It's called the NTV Economic Bible Collection. It's going to strengthen your church. It'll strengthen other churches. So check it. You can see the link in the show notes. And it's, it's good for other Christian organizations and ministries, but it's particularly good for churches. Thank you, Tyndale, for being our sponsor. Thank you for providing this new translation that I think is just going to be a great, great boon to many churches. And as always, thank you for being a part of Rainer on Leadership. Those of you who are seeing us on YouTube, subscribe like, tell us, tell us that you see us, get, get other people so we can get this Christian word out. This is our ministry to you. And these sponsors are paying the bills and you get, get your eyeballs on this thing. Then uh, podcasting out, give us a rating and review. We, we say that all the time, but there's a reason behind it. The more you do that, the better we can get sponsors to then provide this ministry for you. So as always, thanks for being a viewer or a listener at Rainer on Leadership. We'll see you next week in the next episode.